What is up? Welcome back to another edition of the PFF Draft Podcast. This is Draft Pod 9.0. We're about to hit double digits. And if it sounds a little differently to you, that's because I'm not actually in Cincinnati right now. I'm visiting some family in Orlando, Florida. So we're going to be doing this over Skype at the moment, uh, like most of our podcasts have been in the past. Not in person, but we still think we got a great show for you today. We're going to start off first by plugging Draft Pass once again. Thank you for all the people that rated us five stars last week. We will inform the one winner here coming up shortly, but we'll do it again this week. We're going to give away yet another Draft Pass subscription. If you go to iTunes, rate us five stars, go to Android, wherever your podcast provider is, go rate us five stars. Send us, either send us on Twitter or a link somewhere saying that you rated us five stars and we'll pick another winner next week to get a free subscription. I know Steve uses it every single day, and we've updated it with a ton of functionality at this point. Steve, you got anything to add in terms of what we've been doing uh, with the draft pass? Yeah, it's going to get a big update on Monday. We're going to get up to 250 profiles. It's already got 200 in there right now. I think my favorite part is the fact that you have the online access and the downloadable PDF, because I use both. Sometimes I have the PDF, and I'll surf around. Sometimes I'm just online. Look around. You have all that information. And if you're not subscribing, you don't get you get that little cutoff, you know, sign up here and it's got all the all the grades, advanced stats, stuff you can't find anywhere else beneath that little paywall. So get involved, get get uh, get plugged into the community. And I like, Mike, when when people send me stuff that they found out of there, we, we get tweets every now and again. Hey, I found this stat and all that. That's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, stuff that you know sometimes we don't even have a chance to dig into. So if you guys find anything cool, send it along, tweet it out. I'll retweet you. But, uh, yeah, just having some fun getting ready for for draft week. It's coming up soon. Coming up soon. That's the thing. Less than two weeks away at this point. And the breaking, the big news in the draft world is that Mike Renner did his first mock of the draft season. People couldn't be talking about it more. Oh, yeah. It's all over uh, everywhere. I think uh, ESPN and uh, Kuiper and McShay were breaking it down, weren't they? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I had requests picks? to go on a bunch of different TV shows. I said, no, I'm committed to PFF. I got I to gotta stay loyal to this podcast. That's the only place we're going to hear my takes. So, the Today yeah, man, show it's, was it's, all over. It, <laughs> it's everywhere, man. I just It's coming from all angles. But like I said, committed to this podcast. I'm going to only deliver my takes here because I know the loyal listeners – don't want to see my work diluted down by going on crappy TV shows like that. So, yeah, uh, the table's going to turn here. Steve's going to grill me on my mock for once, but I actually I, I gotta gotta have a caveat. I said I did my first mock. It wasn't really a mock. It was I called it a dream mock. If you want to go check it out, it's on the website right now. This was mock draft week for us. We put out four different four different analysts did their mock drafts. And mine was a little different in that it was the optimal scenario for every single team. So I had the 49ers at number two getting Miles Garrett, as well as the Cleveland Browns at number one getting Miles Garrett. I had a handful of teams getting Marshawn Lattimore. I had a handful of teams getting Mitchell Trubisky. It was basically if the chips fall the right way, what is the best possible pick you can hope for for your team? And I did that for one big reason. It's basically so that the comments wouldn't keep saying worst mock draft ever because those hurt me. I remember when I started off as an analyst, I, I an would ego read, thing. Oh yeah. I would read all the comments and I would print them out and post them up all over my walls, all the mean ones. And I would cry myself to sleep at night because I couldn't stand that people were so mean to me online. It's soft. But this, I have to say that played a big part in the factor of why I didn't want to do a real mock, but it, I think it turned out well. Didn't get a lot of hateful comments. I'll say so. You did get a success. comment, which was going to be my first criticism. You can't mock the same player to multiple teams, Mike. What are you doing? You can't send Marshawn Lattimore to five different teams. That's ridiculous. But I, I think that's proof that yourself. people don't read. I was say people don't read the intros to articles. I'll, I'm guilty of that as well. But I don't even want to yeah, write them because I've, people don't read them, right? Should we just can we just skip them forever? It's a mock draft. What do you need for an introduction? Other than you do need to give an explanation of what this mess is. Yes, I mean the introduction should be this is a mock or this is what I would do if I was a GM or this is what I think the GMs will do and then end. So. All right. So you need you need me to tear this apart? Yeah, Gotta say table turn the table. The Steve's going to Steve's going to tell me what's wrong with mine. Okay, so the Let's first go. one, the first thing, and it's not really a huge complaint, but Marshawn Lattimore now to the Jaguars as their best case scenario. Of course, everybody said, "Well, they just drafted Jalen Ramsey last year." They just paid A.J. Boye. Is that too much? Are there, are there too many corners? I don't hate it, but I think it's an interesting pick. So I at least wanted to point yep. it out. Let's say we'll get into that a little later. 
But here was the thing. One, I think everyone has struggled with what to give the Jags at four. I, I noted that in the article saying people are giving them O.J. Howard and Leonard Fournette, which would just be the dumbest selections in my mind because a tight end or a running back in the top five is just ridiculous to me. I don't care how good they are. I don't think that positional value is worthy of a top five pick, especially running back, especially Fournette. I just don't think he's a great running back in general. I've made my thoughts on him known, but I think everyone struggled with this. I just keep going back to, though, and it was the point I made in the article as well. What team with three nasty cornerbacks has ever had even a defense outside of the top five in recent memory? What team with three nasty cornerbacks has ever been Somebody a, do some research for us. an has? average even like an average defense because of how important the passing game is, how important it is to be able to play man coverage. I just think if you had Marshawn Lattimore, AJ Boye and Jalen Ramsey, you have a top five defense for the foreseeable future with all three of those guys in your roster. I don't care what the rest of the roster looks like. People were talking about Ramsey and his versatility at this point last year. He could play in the slot. He could play safety. Exactly. Maybe it is time to tap into that and stick Lattimore. You have Miles Jack's versatility. You have Jalen Ramsey's versatility. All of a sudden, you have a defense that looks unbelievable on paper, almost Denver Broncos-esque in terms of what they can do on the back end. I I mean, you're going to... What, you're going to reach for a running back to pass that up? I don't think so. I mean, I agree with you as far as the way the mock drafts are going. People are like, oh, I can't fill a need. I'm just going to put Leonard Fournette and O.J. Howard in here. It's ridic- it is a little ridiculous. But um, I like the concept. I-, I guess my first real complaint, number 10, Buffalo, John Ross as their perfect fit. I think I understand why you did it because his speed and Tyrod Taylor probably once a game drops in a perfect deep ball. That'd be a good yes. fit for Ross. But... I still think the same guy that you had at number nine, Corey Davis, would be a better fit there because, you know, they still have, they have Sammy Watkins who could be that deep threat. I'd rather a guy that's more of a complimentary player to him rather than Ross. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to have, you know, double speed guys on the outside, but for me, it's still Corey Davis over Ross for a perfect fit. Let's see. What else you have here? Ruben Foster. So, say, my, my explanation for that pick was, and I said it, that Tyrod Taylor is the ultimate second reaction, break the pocket, that sort of, you know, play breaks down, find someone late. John Ross is the ultimate receiver in my mind and that sort of, on those sort of plays as well. Play breaks down. How are you going to stick with John Ross for three seconds, four seconds, you know, after the play? And they run a lot, a ton of the deep cross on play action. He's about as dangerous as it gets in that play. So I think, I think it's a, uh, I, it was a tough pick as well, but I think that's a good fit. I'll just say. You put a, I mean, you put I think a lot of thought. Fits. You put a lot of thought into this. Well uh-huh. the two, two that I like, Reuben Foster to the Saints and Reuben Foster to the Arizona Cardinals. I think those are two teams that just really need that hammer in the middle of the defense. Reuben Foster would be great for both teams. I like that. Tredavious White with the Thank Eagles. You, you know, I, I'm back and forth on Tredavious. We're going to end up having like about a mid-first round uh, expectation on him, but... He's had some up and down parts to his career that um, you know bring some question, I think, to mind with with Tre'Davious White. But it's I not think the, the Eagles worst thing. would love to trade back and from that pick just because, like you said, the the cornerback that will be there for them isn't going to be anything amazing in terms of value at that point. But then there's a ton right. of late first round corners that if they got to there, they'd still find a good one. So I think uh, I think they would of all of a lot of they are one of a handful of teams that would love to trade back in this draft. Yeah, I think the cornerback class has taken an interesting turn where I think it it looked like it had a bunch of guys that were, you know, five or six guys that were first-round picks, including Tease Tabor, Jordan Lewis, Sidney Jones, and then all of those guys have various issues, off-field, mm-hmm. injuries, just running four sevens. <laughs> and I think that pushes a lot of those guys down a little bit closer to the second round. So this went from this loaded first round cornerback class in my mind to one that's more loaded in the second round because they all have a question mark or two Ooh, not gonna lie, good, tease. good tease we'll get to that later we'll, as well, we'll so. get to that later so not gonna lie mike i don't i don't hate many of these picks um when i, I was get, gonna say the draft the, the format i did for the mock was very well set up to not hate a lot of the picks yeah i mean was, you was you, the I, reason i did it you did it just <laughs> for your ego which yes i did is not I don't know if that's quality content, Mike. I was going to say, what else do I not do just for my ego, Steve? That's like my entire life. Well, you let your hair grow out and you look ridiculous and it doesn't seem to phase you, Mm -hmm. but it's all good. Yeah, I get compliments on it, so. Yeah, it's all good. So I'm going to say Seattle at 26. I understand Garrett Bowles from from an athleticism standpoint. They're going to love him, but we've talked about it in the past, too. 
because he's J.R. Sweezy is because he's the J.R. Sweezy, he's JR. Of, Sweezy of tackles. Of tackles. I mean, if perfect? he's there on the board when the Seahawks are picking, there's all I would put my life savings on him being the pick. I'll just say that. At no, the, no, I at agree. This point. I agree with you there. I okay. just. I would say their best. Can, I would rather see them from a best case scenario standpoint. If we like, if we were picking there, say a Forest Lamp, or even okay. a Ryan Ramchek, who, you know, Ramchek. I don't know that we we always see him going around twenty in our world <laughs> in our mock drafts, and he feels like a guy that could be like the Chargers reach for him at seven, or Oof. ends up at the back end. That would be so round. Chargers, but yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I don't have. That's the thing. Once it gets to this like the later half of the first round, I was really sort of up in the air in terms of value, where guys were getting valued by the NFL. And I think everyone kind of is. No one really knows once you get to the back half of the first round where the dominoes are going to fall. But I think you're kind of right in the fact that this offensive tackle class is bad. But at the same time, teams are so desperate for offensive tackles always that they'll they'll go. They'll just be off the board at some point. So I think Bulls doesn't make it there. I don't think Ramchick makes it there either. When all is said and done. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So the, the rest, I, I, pretty fun comments on your Green Bay Packers pick and your New Orleans Saints pick, giving them both, giving them both Marlon Humphrey. I wow. don't have many other complaints. I, I don't know if Njoku's the best case scenario for the Pittsburgh Steelers, but um, again, That was very it. much similar to the Jaguars pick in that you all of a sudden have just an offense that is unstoppable. If you take Njoku in the first round and, Marta- and Martavis Bryant comes back healthy, you have the, you know, antithesis of the Jaguars and that you just have this offense where you can go to five different weapons uh, on your front at all times and defenses really don't have an answer anymore. So that was in the similar vein. Yeah, I've been trying to do that with the Giants and saying that their best case best case scenario is OJ Howard. And then you're looking at Odell Beckham, Brandon Marshall on the outside, Sterling Shepard in the slot, OJ Howard up the seam, a tight end. Mm-hmm. I think that's their best case. Oh, scenario. I 100% same, same is. Idea. I don't think I've seen a mock in the last month, though, where O.J. Howard hasn't been off the board uh, by about pick 15. So that no, just didn't it. seem realistic to me at that point. So, so I have to but say, you've look. accomplished your goal. I didn't trash you too bad. First comment, cool mock concept, Mike. Good job, man. I, hope I was going to say, ego. when you get positive comments on a mock draft, that's, that's next level wrong. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go back and check the... Uh, page views on these things and see which ones did well because I, I can't imagine that yours that yours did well it's this big touchy feely deal and it's not there's just not enough controversy there no for controversy, a guy that loves his yeah, hot takes you really took the easy way out here mock drafts really are to generate controversy in mind just made You're people like, feel too nope, good about themselves yep, everybody's getting what they want here in mike's mock <laughs> that's it they're all winners uh the uh, it was a good draft. everybody was gets a good a trophy one, mock from from mike renner <laughs> let's actually let's go right into this though so since we did the mock we got a new segment for you this week that we think you're gonna love and it's we did mock week and these are our favorite comments from all four mock drafts this, this past true. week uh that, obviously that was my favorite comment the cool mock draft concept but there was some guy who did disagree with my mock. danny <laughs> kelly and i keep getting the worst mock comment at you know worst mock draft ever comment going back and forth and you know he'll get it he'll say your move steve and then i get it and mine's the worst mock it was i thought daniel jeremiah had the worst mock and then this thing showed up so then i'm i'm a little ahead but danny kelly the other day had a guy tell him that he has a website or a subreddit or something a whole facebook page maybe that is dedicated to posting mock drafts so that people can look at them analyze them see them all in one place and danny kelly's was so bad that the guy who collects mock drafts wouldn't even post his mock draft. So I just <laughs> That's say, such a winner. <laughs> I just want to say, you know, there's one thing to just have the worst mock ever, but to have one that a mock draft enthusiast turns down, denies, keeps off of his website, that is setting an entire new standard. The, the bar has been raised, and kudos to you, Danny Kelly. I was going to say, none of ours I don't think were that bad, but that's, oof, that's next level low. Just It's pretty special. You're not. Yeah. Congratulations, Danny. We didn't. You beat us. Uh, All right. But we're going to name some of our favorites. My favorite on mine was pretty tame. It was the Jaguars just wasted a top five pick on the slot corner, apparently, either this year or last year. Mm, Better than wasting a top five pick on a quarterback or edge rusher like they usually do. So I'm cool with that. You should direct them right. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Beautiful explanation. That was low. That was low of me. Uh, But still hate you even more. 
All right, here was the the best on Gordon McGinnis's mock draft. Here was the best comments by a man named Tyler Hayes. He said, do you pay any attention to the Bills or have you even bothered to look at their roster? Kyle Williams long-term replaced it as Adolphus is Adolphus Washington, the third-round pick last year, who played well as a rookie. Malik Hooker and Jamal Adams are on the board, and you pick a defensive tackle. The one thing Buffalo is stacked with, what an idiot. They would take Davis, Thomas, Howard, or Reddick before Allen, too. So, what a Gordon, idiot. you're an idiot, Gordon. All right, here's the best on Jordan Plockers that just came out today, so go check that one out. But he, this one I love, and this one was the best of any comment all this week, and it said... Please go to rehab. You need help. Ross at five and Lawson at 18 for the Titans. LMFAO, terrible. McCaffrey at number two, five question marks. So Jordan's going to rehab after that comment because apparently. McCaffrey at two is pretty shocking, but I don't know if it's worth five question marks. Maybe two or three. That's a handful. two or three. I would have thrown in an exclamation point with the question marks, but. He just was very puzzled by the pick. Uh, and this was the best comment on Josh Liskowitz's mock draft. It said, what a putz with periods in between those. He got the first pick right. After that, madness. <laughs> so you got Miles actually, Garrett, and then it all went down. That one was short and to the point. That's, that one I liked, actually. That's, that's, that's the template for mock draft comments. Insult the guy right away. Then tell them why the picks are just. Then tell them that the picks are just bad. So start off with insults, then criticize. I, I think that's that's classic mock draft comment right there. So those are the good. best of the week. Uh, that's that's a lot of fun. It is. It, it's why I spend so much time on mock drafts. And you know, you did the cop out move, but I spend a lot <laughs> of time because I'm always thinking, wait, if I make this pick, how many mean comments am I going to get? You yeah, know? you bolt awake in the middle of the night screaming. The comment oh, that you read at the bottom of the article. <laughs> this pick didn't fill a need, and people are upset about that. It didn't fill a need. <laughs> <laughs> and you know me. I don't I don't go in trying to fill needs. That's exactly. the first thing. People, no, we're stacked. We're stacked at the de- on the defensive line. We don't need anybody else. That's impossible. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. It's impossible. Filling That's needs, very mock. overrated. That's a whole different is, podcast, though. Yeah. We'll get to We'll talk. We might talk about this some next week. All right. But uh, let's move on to... An article I wrote, another article I wrote this week. We're just, this is all about me this week. And it's, but it was more of a PFF centric article. If you've been reading any of our draft dailies throughout the past couple months, in each one, we usually post uh, a little segment called My Guys, which is guys that you, the person writing the article, is higher on than usually the general public, someone that they think is going to do well uh, based on, or going to be good value where they end up getting drafted. And, in that similar vein, we went ahead and collected 10 guys that were PFFs guys, 10 guys that we as a collective, when our big board is you know, all said and done, will be higher on than the draft community, than probably where they end up getting selected. And so we wanted to just break down these 10 guys and say basically what our thinking was and why we are higher than them. And number one is not a surprise to anyone if you followed us at all over the past couple of years. It's Derek Barnett, the edge rusher from Tennessee, number three, I believe, on our big board at the moment. Just reshaped He's, it. We moved him down a couple notches. Where did we go? Okay. You, oh yeah, you're it. the you got the big the fresh one off the press. Where is Red, he at in the newest? Let's see. I think I put him at six. Okay, six. But there's almost no chance he goes top five. Very little chance I'll say he goes top ten. And I've seen mocks with him in the twenties, which just unbelievable to me if he ends up going that late i mean the patriots had a uh, a visit with him they don't pick till the third and if they do sneak back into the first it's at 32 and it, it's in in real life it might actually be a realistic he could go in the 20s or late first round i just i think he's a top 10 player in this draft it's a, it really is it's amazing and it goes back to what we said people want a guy to look the part from this you know athleticism standpoint when we see defensive ends succeed again and again that don't have you don't have to check every athleticism box and i think he checks the most important box and it's the three cone he had a sub seven second three cone at 260 pounds right which is that's moving you know that's bending the edge that's turning on a dime that's that's why joey bosa to me was unquestionably the top prospect last year because he had a ridiculous i think he had like a six eight something three cone as well at that size when you can move when you can play at an angle when you can cut 
I think that's as important, if not more important, than explosive and if off the line of scrimmage as an edge rusher. So I really have not a lot of questions about Derek Barnett. I think he's going to be a great player in the NFL. And teams are going to, whoever gets him is going to get a steal. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on Barnett. Um, I have to say, you know, he's we only have two years of data of, of seeing guys go into the NFL, three years total of data. And what, we've talked about it before, our defensive line grades, guys that have just crushed it in our grading system, no matter what their athleticism is, they've pretty much translated to the NFL from Trey Flowers to Grady Jarrett on the interior to Henry Anderson when he's healthy. Uh, Joey Bosa was the same thing last year. Top graded edge rusher in the nation for two straight years. Last year at this time, people are overthinking him. He doesn't look like a Miles Garrett or a Jadavian Clowney. But like you said, has the production, had the three cone, didn't uh, didn't wow people at the combine, had a solid combine, and uh, he went and dominated as a rookie. I think Barnett, people are starting to overthink Barnett because he doesn't have this or that. But like I said, the three-year production is on par with Miles Garrett. And I'll, I give Miles Garrett, you know, that you know, the extra boost because of the athleticism, you feel a little, you know, more comfortable, I think, with him versus Barnett. But I don't think it's this massive gap that maybe people think it is. Agreed. The second guy on our list, also in the SEC, which is a little surprising because they seem to get well, you know, well drafted in terms of uh, their college production to the NFL production. They don't get overlooked, so to speak. And it's Tredavious White, the LSU cornerback, who we talked about a little bit earlier with at the Eagles pick. We have him as our second corner at this point, and not a lot of other people do. Yeah, I, I feel like it's almost by default because there's guys I'd love to have over him, the guys I mentioned earlier. You know, I wish Tease Tabor didn't run a five flat or whatever the heck he ran. I wish that some of these other <laughs> guys, Sidney Jones, didn't get hurt. And um, But I like that White can cover outside. He can cover on the inside. Uh, outstanding in 2014 and in 2016. The 2015 tape wasn't as clean, but... Uh, very good ball skills, playmaking. He, he, he brings a lot to the table. We really like really like White, and I, I like that versatility that he brings to the table. Super aggressive, too. I think he's one of the most aggressive cornerbacks in this class. Broke up 12 passes a season ago in terms of pass breakups and only allowed 26 catches all season long, 13 games. That's to a game that's pretty ridiculous. So I, I'm a fan. I think I think I do think that this cornerback class, while it's getting pushed down, going to have a handful of guys who are successful NFL starters. I, I still think that they, it is Oh yeah. It's kind of getting pushed down because of the just talent all around in this draft. I still think it's going to produce five or six guys who become quality NFL quarter cornerbacks. So I, I think and I think Tre Davis White is definitely one of them at this point. So yep. Tre Davis White was number 2. Still really good. Yep. Tre Davis White was number 2. Number three, Corey Davis, the Western Michigan wide receiver. I kind of went rogue on this one because I'm a little higher. I'm a lot higher on him than probably even you are. I just think. Well, Mike, I is. know you haven't seen the big board yet. We just made it. We just officially made him our number one wide receiver. Thank you. I've been pushing for it ever since. Ever since I really dug into both of them a couple months ago, Mike Williams and Corey Davis. I just think Davis is much more complete of a wide receiver. He doesn't have this physical sort of dominance that you look for at the position that, you know, Julio Jones has. But he's similar to A.J. Green in the fact A.J. Green wasn't eye-poppingly athletic, but consistently just clean in everything he does. And I think that's Corey Davis at this point. I just love the feel he has for, for zone coverage, for getting open against man coverage. He's an outstanding route runner. I really think that's the first thing that stands out to me. Uh, I feel really good about him. I've compared him to Keenan Allen as far as that ability, that wiggle to get open. Uh, has really good ball skills, too. He's made a lot of highlight catches. Uh, you know, Again, I think he's the best route runner in the draft, and then he's flashed all those other things, the, the downfield catches, the yards after the catch ability. So I think, I think Davis can do it all. Big fan of him. Number four is a guy who I admittedly have not seen much, but I went based on our big board. It's Nathan Jerry, the safety from Nebraska. So, Steve, you'll have to enlighten me on this one a little bit. Yeah, so the thing I like about him, it's a two, 2014, one of the top coverage grades in the entire nation. Same thing in 2016. He's a guy that if you put him in the right scheme and, you know, that the right scheme for him, I think, is a, a scheme that plays a lot of too high, you know, cover two, cover four, quarters type looks. When he played quarters at Nebraska, he was so good working downhill on the ball, breaking on the ball, making plays, had a ton of interceptions, a ton of pass breakups throughout his career at Nebraska. Um, he's not your cleanest athlete. I don't think he's the guy that you necessarily want playing center field a whole lot in a cover one, cover three type scheme. But for the mm -hmm. right scheme, he's a playmaker. 
And I think the big question for him was his tackling. And he really, I think he only had seven missed tackles last year. I don't have my draft pass in front of me at the moment, but that's one of those things in draft pass. You can check his year by year missed tackles. And 2016 was a huge step forward. So I like Gary quite a bit. I think he's a, he's going to be a good player. And unfortunately he kind of gets lost in the mix of this deep safety class, but it's one of those things based off scheme. You could, he could be the fifth best safety. could be the 10th best safety, but Again, I think we're still higher on him than most. My favorite stat from Jerry in the draft process that I found was one completion all last season of 20 plus yards for a safety, especially a quarter safety. That's very impressive and considering how often you get targeted at that position. So I, I think that like you've talked about, just executing your job, not limiting big plays as a safety is about is has so much value at the NFL level that I think that's what Jerry can bring to the table. Number five, we had Carl Lawson, the edge rusher from Auburn. I'm I'm much higher in this guy than I'd say most. I think the punch he packs is as good, if not better, than anyone in this class. He's one of the few guys who legitimately is a bull was a bull rush threat in college already. So few guys coming from college are, I want to say, you know, experienced with the bull rush already. They have to learn that on the fly, kind of once they get to the NFL. Not Lawson. He's already an ox. He already bull rush tackles into quarterbacks routinely there in the SEC. Higher grade last season than Miles Garrett as a pass rusher. And I I just think he's, I think he's Brandon Graham 2.0. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it. I think he's that good. I like that comparison. I think it's a good comp. Uh, I think think the profile and draft pass compared him to Cameron Wake, but for not for stylistic reasons, but more for He's going to be the, probably a pass rush specialist for a while as yes. he develops against the run. Um, I like That's the Brandon fair. Graham comp as far as body type and style. Um, I've liked Lawson for a while. Did you ever figure out why people are low on him? I, we've talked about this I internally. No we have I, I've out. seen like five mock drafts uh, from you know the larger uh, NFL media. None had him in the first round even. I just... I can't believe that'd be the case, especially with some of the edge needy teams at the end of the first round. Right. I don't I don't know what it is. I, is it the Noah Spence thing where they just think he can't play the run? But even if that's the case, he's still going to play. People don't care about 600, that anymore. Yeah, it's at 600 snaps a year, even if you're just playing passing down. So yeah, he's not I, he's not a playmaker against the run. And again, if you have draft pass, go check out his run stop percentage the last couple of years, or at least last year in our signature stats. It's pretty low. He doesn't make a ton of plays against the run. I think he starts out as a pass rush specialist. But again, he's a guy I've been I followed him since recruiting, and he was a stud as a recruit. He was a stud as a freshman, got hurt as a sophomore and as a junior, was banged up. But when he was on the field, he was good. And then last year, all I wanted to see, put together a full season. And he did. You know, he did. He put a a ton of pressures, was very disruptive. I do like Lawson. I think he's a first-round player. Yeah, maybe it's a combination of injury concerns with the two in, two years of injury and the fact that, like you said, he's, he's not a finisher. He only had 15 total tackles all season long a year ago. He's going to be a guy who is going to have more pressures than sacks. He might be a seven sack a year guy, but a ton of, you know, pressures over the course of that because he's not really he doesn't have that kind of sort of closing ability that some of the other edge players in this class have. But I'm on board, man. I'm taking him mid first if I got to pick in that range. So that's that's Carl Lawson, number five on the list. On to number six, Kareem Hunt, running back from Toledo. I know you're a fan, Steve. He's sixth on our running back board at the moment. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I believe it's six. Again, I just got to check these updates here. Where are you, Kareem Hunt? Second round, second round grade for uh, mm-hmm. for Kareem Hunt. And last year we had a second round grade on your boy, Jordan Howard. My boy. Uh, so yeah, Hunt is Hunt is our number six running back. The term. So the the funny part about this, I came up with this term, and then our running back expert Matt Clausen, when he wrote the initial profile on him kind of described it the same way balance through contact and it just is it was the first thing that he highlighted first thing that i see unbelievable balance his balance ratio is incredible he oh yeah and, i mean he gets tackled because you're supposed to get you get tackled with the ball it ends the play but his balance ratio is still outstanding balance through contact is really good and i think that's the biggest thing forced 98 missed tackles in 2016 which is incredible uh i think he can catch the ball out of the backfield he can pass protect underrated player and he's one of those guys that we put a second round grade on who could who could realistically be there in the third fourth or fifth round based off the way just the running backs go in the draft sometimes so big fan of hunt 
so many of the subtleties of the running back position in terms of vision, subtle cuts to set up a block, that sort of thing that don't really wow you. That won't, you know, it's not an 80 yard highlight run that he makes, but he does those little things that are so important to success at the NFL level. I think those are more important than, uh, you know, than the breakaway speed, than this utter power that some running back that some people fall in love with at the running back position. I think that ability to set up cuts similar to like an Arian Foster. I think that's what Kareem Hunt could be at the next level. Arian Foster. I like that. Am I just throwing out the comps that we should have had here? You might because we didn't have we didn't have Rand Graham. We didn't have Foster for Hunt. Oh, man. Who do we have? Just get me to do all the profiles. next year. Oh, man. I kind of like the Arian Foster comp. I'm I'm changing it right now. (laughs) Do it. All right. Number seven on the list, keeping it moving, we had Jordan Lewis, cornerback from Michigan. I know he has the off-field stuff going on uh, from a, a month or so ago, but I just think his production in college, going up against some good receiver, he never really got, no one really ever got the best of him, is, is what I keep going back to. Yes, you have this worry about lack of top-end speed, lack of top-end size, but if it wasn't ever really an issue, if you couldn't see it ever be an issue, I still think it's going to be it's sort of overrated changing to the next level. His ball skills make up for a lot of those deficiencies. I'm still on board with Jordan Lewis as a late first, early second kind of guy. Ball, ball skills really good. Um, I use the term feisty man corner. You know, he can he can mirror you at the line of scrimmage. He just he's he plays sticky coverage. He does. The thing that worries me a little bit about him, it, a little bit of the size. A little bit of the speed, but just as much worrying me is just kind of the way he plays the ball down the field. He almost like allows himself to get stacked by the receiver, play in a trail position. And then he has such good ball skills, he kind of plays through the receiver. He does that really well. That's one of those things I feel like against your bigger receivers, against, say, a Brandon Marshall or an Alshon Jeffrey, a guy that knows how to use his body better than some of the college corner, uh, college wide receivers might mm-hmm. get the better of him. Just it's It's a style thing for him. But, man, the playmaking ability is absolutely great. And I think he's got the movement skills to play in the slot as well. So he can play outside, play in the slot if necessary. That, I love that versatility. And I know slot corners don't usually get you, you know, they're not usually first round picks, but like Tredavious White, guys that could play both, I think that's added value in today's NFL. And you need, yep. here's the point I always make you can't just get all six foot three corners. You just can't do it. You need guys that can cover <laughs> the Julian Edelmans, the T.Y. Hiltons, even the Odell Beckhams, just guys that are so good, just the good route runners. And I think that's the type of corner that Lewis is because those six foot two, six foot three guys, they get turned around by good yep. route runners. So I think there's a lot of value to Lewis. Yeah, Lewis, 24 bro- pass breakups last two years, most in the country over that span. I'm a fan. Someone's going to get a steal. Eighth guy on our uh, list here. This is one of my guys here. Mac Hollins, wide receiver, North Carolina. One word, Steve, and it's speed. It's second gear speed is what so, I see. Oh, okay, that's three words. It's my second bad. gear. It's that that long speed? Is that uh, draft pause? That's long speed. 2.0, 3.0. It's that second gear that he has. He has so many plays, even plays where he's not targeted, where he just gets on the corner so quickly and just gets, just boom, zooms right past him. So it, it's one of those things that he, he's, he hasn't been targeted a whole lot. When he has been targeted, he's averaged only 20.6 yards per catch. Over the last three years, at six foot two, six foot four, two hundred twenty four. pounds, has that speed that's just subtle. Gets on cornerback so quickly. If he could stay healthy and you know maybe fit, you know, not the greatest route runner or anything, but he's got some of that. You know, Martavis Bryant just came in and was a deep threat. He has some of that to him where he could just be that deep ball guy and uh, you know sneak up on cornerbacks and make plays. Yeah, there's so many tools there to work with from a size speed perspective that. I mean, just run him on deep posts, goes, double moves all day, and just don't don't even like worry about those underneath. So put him. I'd love to see him go to a Carolina. I'd love to see him go to an Arizona, where he's utilized in a role that suits him like that. But like you mentioned, 144 targets only over the last three seasons, fewer than 50 a year, only 1,667 yards over that span. It's concerning, but we're still fans. This is Bryson Vestnero's boy as well, I believe. So. Uh, Bryson yeah, a lot of fans yep. of, a lot of fans of him here at PFF. He's what do we have Matt on our board, Steve? Man. I keep going back to it. Keep, keep putting you on the spot with this. I'm going Control F in the document here. 
He's he's down to 101. I think we okay. moved a couple guys so above him because of late uh, third. Yeah, because of more, you know, the some guys being able to do 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 more than him, but as a pure deep threat, man, he can he can do a lot. Got it. All right, on to number 9. Tanzel Smart, Tulane defensive tackle. Guy I haven't heard of much about much ever since the senior bowl, but I still like him in the mid rounds of the draft. And he was probably either him or Eddie Vander does most impressive guys at the senior bowl. In my opinion that I saw there. Do you remember what you said about Eddie though at the senior? Oh, Eddie was the fattest guy at the senior bowl too. Well, that's least impressive when he had his shirt off. Most impressive when he had the pads on. Thank you for for clarifying because our listeners are going to go back and say, wait, did you say Eddie was fat or something? But on the field, no, Eddie he was, was pretty so good. Yeah. Smart was good, too. And I always lump him in with Larry Ogunjobi from Charlotte because they're both guys who are underrated, really good run-stopping players. Both of them showed well at the Senior Bowl. Smart adds just a little bit more pass rush ability. I think he can get after both the quarterback a little bit more. Helps. We called him a dominant bull rusher. Our guy John Breitenback wrote up the report. Big fan of him. And Smart's one of those guys that each time our analysts do a Tulane game, they come back and say, boy, that guy can play. So... We've been hearing about him since the fall as far as just a, a guy that stands out. And then even when we went back, rewatched all of his tape, uh, certainly stands out as a guy that I think somebody's going to get a steal probably in the third or fourth round range. Here's my favorite stat about Tanzel Smart. Against Louisiana Lafayette, he played 100 snaps wow. in an NFL game. As a defensive tackle, clocking the scales around 300 pounds, that's, that's ridiculous. That's Iron Man type of stuff. He didn't want to come off the field. Had one of the better grades in the FBS this past season, so I'm a big fan of his as well. Good stat. I like it. Yeah, moving on to number 10, your boy here at linebacker, Blair Brown from Ohio. Talk to me about Blair, Steve. Where, do you, where, you, where is he on our board now? Where do we, and I heard you were moving him up. Where would you put him? Let's see. Where's Blair? He's still in that third-round range for us, 119 overall. Okay. But we, see, we see him as a third-round type of player, but that's the fifth linebacker. Uh, in in the class for us. So linebacker, I think, is top-heavy with your Reuben Foster, Zach Cunningham's, Jared Davis, Hassan Reddick, however you want to call him. But Blair Brown, our number five linebacker, who is only 5'11", 5'11", 238. That's not supposed to be ideal size for a linebacker. And he's not a guy that's going to, you know, stack and shed and, you know, take on offensive linemen, but he's so quick to the point of attack and gets under blockers at the point of attack. So he's good in the run game. I think he's athletic enough to uh, to play coverage. I think he's athletic enough to play well there. And three straight years of just strong all around grading for Blair Brown. So big fan of his. And again, it's a it's one of these weak. It's a weak middle round linebacker class. And I think Brown is one of those guys that uh, that he could be a steal. Finished at ninety two point four overall, number two overall grade to only Reuben Foster last year in the FBS. Brown also, in my opinion, has the single best stat of any single player in this draft class. My favorite stat, the single most eye-popping wow stat, and it's the fact that on 134 tackle attempts last season, he missed three tackles, Oof. which is unheard of. A draft Guys like Ruben, stat there. like out. everyone, almost every single other linebacker in this draft class is in the teens, you know, into the 20s even. Three missed tackles in college with the spread offenses with how much field you have to cover on 134 attempts. That's mind-boggling type of number. Very so impressive Blair Brown. for Brown. Sure tackler. Impressive. For, yeah, because a lot of these top guys, I, I, my, the thing I keep saying about Zach Cunningham, who we have a you know late first-round grade on, is like everything's great except he doesn't tackle. And <laughs> it's kind of important. Hey, I, said, I said tackling was overrated. No, no, that was my take. That tackling. Was. Overrated. But... But you're still impressed but by only three. when you're that good. Well, I'll say when you're that good at it, though, that has that has value as well. Only 18 misses over the last three years, too. Cunningham almost had that this year. Yeah. All right. Well, he's he's moving up our board. Blair Brown, we're fans. On to some segments. Our favorite part of the show. We already hit the mock draft comments. On to the scouting term of the week. And last week we did gap zone running back fit now we're going to do man zone cornerback fits steve what are the traits you look for in each what is the difference because you hear it all the time what's the difference between the two well i think a a man corner a man corner is a guy that covers in man coverage well and Mm. that's just a yes no thing you watch him does he (laughs) cover guys yes yeah i think there are complicated i'll say (laughs) there are man traits though 
is what I was more driving. I think things like size, speed, and length, as some sort of high level combination of those are important for man coverage. So a guy like Richard Sherman can play man coverage because he has the size and the length. A guy like Chris Harris can play man coverage because he has the speed and, and the quickness. So, so I think there's a difference. There's a sort of like a handful of check boxes that you have right. to fill to meet the man corner standards. If you're a little slower, a little smaller, don't have the length, you still be a good corner in the NFL, just not necessarily being deemed as a man corner. So Josh Norman didn't have the size, didn't have the speed, gets deemed a zone corner in the NFL. No, I, I like the description. I look for the footwork in a guy. So if a guy's not a Richard Sherman, long press type of corner, I look for the footwork in a guy that can just mirror off the line of scrimmage. So like Darrell Rebus at his best. I don't even think Rebus was that physical at the line of scrimmage. He just could mirror a receiver. Yeah, the movement. speed. For, yeah. He was just there, I think but he, he had one of the best three cones of all time. Didn't he have like a 6'5", something three cone, which is just... He may have. Yeah. His, his change of direction was incredible, and he would just, boom, no matter what move a receiver is putting on, on him at the line of scrimmage, he was just there with him. And then his technique was flawless. He would just get on top of the route, cut guys off, and, and there was never anywhere to go with the ball. I think if you don't have that, you have to make up for it with a Sherman style of play, which is that physicality and having um, good press technique. and Keep to lead length and that sort yes. of thing. Yep, using that length in, in a man coverage situation. So, fine, those are your traits, man. But but still, it's one of those things, if you watch a guy over time and it's like, here are all his man coverage snaps, it's a lot of times it's just a yes or no. You know, is he is he doing yeah. it or is he not? And of course, I agree. Of course, no, I agree with that as well. It. And I think for zone corners, you want – you need some sort of short area agility, breaks on balls. You can't be getting flat-footed uh, and, you know, stuck in mud, so to speak. As a zone corner, you have to be quick to react. There's that sort of trait that goes with playing zone. And also just feel for zone. You can't sometimes teach guys to feel, to, to know how route concepts are going to be run from, to read that sort of stuff. So there's that innate, uh, some sort of innate feel to zone corners as well. That, again, like you said, comes from watching guys play zone coverage a lot. And seeing yeah. what they do. Yeah, I'd say there's that. There's tackling, which I think is a little bit more important. You're mm-hmm. going to have a lot more open field tackles in zone. I mean, there's a couple ways to play in zone, too. There's your matchup zone that's essentially going to turn into man. But you have to read route concepts. You have to know when to pass off and then take a guy. You need to know when to just carry a route. And then there's more spot zone type of type of coverage or cover two where you know you have to maybe press a guy. You know, get some depth to take away a deep route. Work from deep to short. So there is just a feel for zone coverage, that's really important. You mentioned that click and close ability, that ability to close on the ball. I want to see that for sure. So that was last year at this time, studying Devontae Harris from Texas A&M, who went to the Saints as an undrafted player and made the roster. I mean, his short his short area quickness and change of direction was just incredible. Some of the breaks he made on the ball, unreal. And you could picture that in an off-zone coverage type of setting, you know, that guy being able to make plays. The problem with him hmm. was was the, the long, long speed. speed the long speed just wasn't there and then you look got at got outran like, by laquan treadwell oh yeah that was bad <laughs> that was not good laquan's four six ran away from him in that one game but yeah. well, then you see a guy like Artie burns who went to a zone heavy team in pittsburgh and when he played off coverage at miami a guy runs a curl and he's still back he's still in his back pedal for two or three yards that's when you see that slow transition it just doesn't look like a good <laughs> fit and burns Started out slow. He, you know, he started to figure it out toward the end of the year, but I still don't think he's a great fit for what Pittsburgh likes to do. As a press corner, though, he was really good. He used that length exceptionally mm-hmm. well. So there you have it. Hopefully that was enlightening. It got a little convoluted there in the middle, but I think I think we hit on the, the main points in zone versus man corner. Now for our new scouting term of the week, though, we got a little something special for you. We special called guest. upon a special guest who had a fantastic new scouting term of the week so here we go and now it's time for one of our favorite segments it's the time in the show when we make up a scouting term mike and i have been doing this the entire draft season in all the draft podcasts be sure to go back and check those out hashtag dolphin backer hashtag tackle radius it's all there we've encouraged our listeners to take those hashtags and go ask your favorite nfl draft analyst you know something using that hashtag who's got the best hashtag tackle radius so as we've been going through trying to figure out new scouting terms i asked my wife if she could come up with anything my wife kelly and she did on the spot came up with one that i think will stick so joining me now is my wife 
Kelly. Welcome back, back to the podcast, because I believe last year you made it on the podcast once with a background sneeze. So welcome back to the podcast. I don't know if you remember that, but I asked you a scouting term. What did you have for us? You did. Um, you asked me a scouting term while we were giving the boys a bath. And Details here. And immediately popped into my head the word swerviness. 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 And as you said, as I said this word to you, I could immediately picture what swerviness was to me in my mind. You're going to have to explain it for the listeners because when you said this and you explained it to me, I actually Snapchatted to Mike and he said, that's it. She's on. (laughs) You made it on to the PFF Pro podcast in front of millions and millions of listeners. Describe swerviness. Well, it starts from the word swerve, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with this lingo, but you can use swerve and be hip and you can tell someone kind of like, get out of my way. You can tell them, hey, swerve. I'm not hip at all. I have no clue what you're I work with about. teenagers. I'm blessed with the gift of being able to be hip with the times. This is amazing. So I... I, I was giving you credit for making this up. You've actually stolen it. Not, well, not really, because it's never actually been used as a football term to describe someone. So when I was thinking of swerviness, what came to mind was a running back or a wide receiver who has this unbelievable ability to maneuver past the defense, not in a way that's shifty. So not someone who's like dodging back and forth, but who is so much better that they can anticipate where the defense is going to be and move before anyone even gets to them. So it's not necessarily making guys miss. It's, it's not, not elusiveness making- and the PFF elusive rating. This is kind of anticipating and, and swerving through the defense. It's swerving through the defense. So we did a little bit of film study before we came on here. Is there a running back in the draft class that just epitomizes swerviness for you? I think Christian McCaffrey. So the Stanford running back, Christian McCaffrey, already a first-round hopeful. Mike thinks he's a first-round lock. He epitomizes swerviness. When I was watching his film, he epitomized what I had pictured in my head. He was just going in and out. He was smooth. He was smooth like butter. (laughs) Smooth like butter. And to be fair, we fired up some Leonard Fournette tape as well, and it took her two runs to say no. This guy does not. He does have not have swerve. No, he is not swervy. Can you use it in a sentence? We need our listeners. They're going to hashtag this and they're going to ask Todd McShay and Mel Kuyper and Mike Mayock. They're going to essentially say who is it? Who has the most swerviness? Who has the most swerve? How do we how do we ask our favorite draft analyst how to use this? It's going to be a hashtag that we'll follow on Twitter. Well, I think the hashtag has to be hashtag swerviness. Okay, so is it which running back has the most swerviness in this draft? Yeah, I think who is who has the most swerviness. All right, that's that's what we're going to do. So most swerviness, make sure you hashtag it. Ask your favorite draft analyst which running back or wide receiver has yes. the most swerviness. You can't forget the wide receiver. I almost feel like a wide receiver has the potential to be more swervy. Well, we're going to have to fire up some wide receiver tape and then I'll see who's... I'll get back to you guys. Next Instagram. week, we'll let you know who the most swervy, who has the most swerviness among the wide receivers. So there you have it. My wife, Kelly, comes up with a scouting term this week. I think it's going to stick. It's going in Christian McCaffrey's scouting report on Draft Pass that you guys need to check out. Stay swervy. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was fantastic. Steve, She's pretty I got to ask, huh? how, do, how does it feel to know that your wife has contributed more to the draft community with one whoa, scouting whoa. term than you have in three years of doing BFF college here. I've contributed quite a bit. No? Uh, Maybe not. You know, is, well, is, is Kelly, is, is she looking for, is she, can we hire her? Can, she is looking is she, for a job. She is looking can we for put a job. Her on the, can we put her on the payroll? We, I, if hey, we I'd love a, it. That'd if be we get a scouting family. term like that every week, that's at worth at least whatever you're making at the moment. Look, let's see if she could do it consistently. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to her next week and see if she has another one. But look, hey, I'm impressed. I'm proud of my I was, was going to say, it's like a man corn. you got to see enough plays from her to know if she can do it or not. So yeah, we'll, we'll see again next week once. if she's got. <laughs> All right, on to our next segment, risers and fallers this week. Guys who we've seen that are rising and falling in our minds. I got a couple for you. I finalized our edge rankings here 
And on that note, I saw Terrell Basham, the Ohio defensive end slash outside linebacker for them. I'm kind of a fan. I, he kind of moved up my board a little bit. I did not like what I saw at the senior bowl. I was not a huge fan of his there. But it was because in the one-on-ones, he wasn't going to basically his by far his best move, and it's the bull rush. He was a bull rush champ at Ohio, just physically manhandling offensive tackles there. And the thing I love from him and that you just don't see all the time and that something that you can't teach, and I'm going to sound like an offensive line coach here, he loves physicality. He loves hitting offensive linemen and moving the line of scrimmage. Some guys, the next guy who I'm going to say here who's falling in my mind is the complete opposite, but Basham relishes that sort of contact, loves when he gets a shot on a ball carrier or a quarterback, does not pass that up. And I think that sort of attitude will translate to some degree as a pass rusher. I think that's has some importance. And so I'm, 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 he's moving up my board a little bit. I think you said bull rush and bull in a China shop for him, right? On bull in China in shop. He was absolutely just down. when he's in space, it's a detriment because he's going a hundred miles per hour at a ball carrier that he probably doesn't have the athleticism to track down when he's going a hundred miles per hour. But when he's coming at an offensive tackle going 100 miles per hour, it works a lot better. So uh, fan of his, I'll say. Moving up my board. Riser. Next guy, faller, Deshaun Hall, the guy opposite Miles Garrett at Texas A&M. They, they're almost twins in terms of their size and length and that sort of thing. But Deshaun Hall is the complete opposite in terms of how physical he is, how physical he plays. He sees so much ground in the run game, even though he's like 6'5", 266 with – I think 35 or something inch arms he's has not good there. He's built the part, but does not want to attack offensive linemen. Guys just move him off the ball. And it, he just does not. He's a, I'll say it, what I, I think I've described him in his scouting profile was he's a hands fighter. So he likes to play high and, you know, try to use that length to win, but he just doesn't have active hands. He gets one swing on you and then he's kind of done. He doesn't keep, he doesn't keep going. He doesn't have the high motor that Basham does. He doesn't, you know, isn't just attacking off its alignment. He's kind of playing patty cake with them more. And that just does not work at the next level. And ironically, so that's not a good scouting report. You still ranked him very close, say, very close round? to a guy that's getting first round hype. Oh, it was one of my followers before. Yeah, Bowser. Yeah, we've already, and I, we've I was, already covered him, but. Let's say, I kind of liked Deshaun Hall from the uh, Senior Bowl because I think he had one of the best win percentages there, but he goes back to the ridiculousness of the Senior Bowl that one of the best win percentages came on, I think, nine pass rushes all week. So he won six of nine, and he was, oh, man, he was so good on those nine pass rushes. That it was nice. It, it really does not mean much. So so uh, small I'll say size, but nice. small, too small a sample size, but he's just from what I saw on tape, just not great. But Bowser, even worse. Man, he's you'd have to teach him to be a pass rusher. So I can get why people are saying Tyus Bowser is an off ball type of guy. Yeah, I can see that. I see the athleticism of the Bowser, but uh, most of his pressures. And again, a, a stat that I dug up on draft pass, a huge percentage of his pressures came either unblocked or in cleanup or against or Louisville <laughs> or against Louisville. The worst offensive looks line. Like they were playing with four offensive linemen for most of the season. Yes. Sometimes they actually were. Like, sometimes guys didn't uh, even take pass sets. That's yeah. how bad they were. Yeah. Or Lamar. <laughs> Who were your risers and fallers, Steve? So I have done a, a lot of work trying to finalize our wide receiver class. And I've mentioned before, I think the wide receiver class, I love the three guys at the top. Corey Davis, Mike Williams, John Ross. Even though Mike Williams is going to be one of my fallers here, I oh. like those guys at the top still. I don't love pretty much five through ten. I don't want to rank anybody. So we had to put somebody <laughs> And it's two guys moving up. Chris Godwin from Penn State, Taewon Taylor from Western Kentucky, both move into the top 10. They're still about third round grades for us, but really liked Taewon Taylor's route running. And um, I, I just think there there's a lot of possession type receivers in this draft. And he's one of the few guys that I just really trust as a as a shifty route runner that has a, a you know enough deep play ability to kind of stretch the field. So I like Taewon, had a very productive career at Western Kentucky. The more I watched him, I've liked him. His hands aren't great, you know, when the ball's not right on his frame, but I think he'll get open enough to make an impact at the next level. And Mike Williams, I still have, we still have a first round grade on him, but we kept calling him in Corey Davis 1A, 1B as receivers. I've come around to Corey Davis is the better overall receiver. And it's seen the light. I've seen the light, but it's, 
it's one of those things like Fournette. Same thing with Fournette. I think if Fournette's in the right situation, he could produce as much as any of those other running backs. I think if Williams is in the right situation, same thing, because he just needs a quarterback that's going to force passes to him, play the mm-hmm. back shoulder game, you know, force it into tight coverage on slants and post, let him go up and get the ball. He does that exceptionally well. But when you compare him to Corey Davis, Corey Davis, when you talk about best fits, I feel like Corey Davis fits every single team. You're saying, yep, he'll yes. fit there, he'll fit there, he'll fit there. With Mike Williams, you say, no, nah, he's not a great fit for, say, Marcus Mariota, who might not best use his skill set. Or he's not a great fit for Andy Dalton, who might not use his skill set. And so Mike Williams, I think, is a little bit more scheme slash quarterback dependent than Corey Davis. Therefore, he fell just a little bit on our draft board. That kind of goes back to a thing that we've, I think we've touched on a few times in the draft podcast, is where we're not an NFL team. So when we rank guys, right. it's basically, if you're, if you're sort of scheme dependent, you get kind of pushed down the board because of that. But at the same time, if you go to a scheme that then fits you, it's like, uh, do we look bad for saying, hey, this guy moved down our board because he was scheme limited, but like he excelled in the scheme that he went to that was perfect for his skill set. So like I said, I'm a fan of analysis. Mike Williams too. If, if he goes to a like you said, somewhere where it's going to pump him balls when it's a quarterback who's going to be fearless in throwing balls into his cover, into his, you know, area when he's not creating a ton of separation. If he goes to someone that's got to see you open, like someone like maybe a Tyrod Taylor, I don't think it'll work out nearly as much. Yeah, I went last year. We did that. We went and we pretty much said we went through each player and said, what's their scheme? What's their fit for each team? Essentially scheme mm-hmm. plus situation. And we, we came up with team boards. And last year I thought it was pretty cool because you'd have, uh, you know, the Steelers might have, um, this is why we hated the Steelers pick of Artie Burns. Artie Burns was really high on our board for teams that played a ton of man coverage, but teams that played a lot of zone, he was probably 150th or 200th. And then he went to a zone team in the Steelers. So Mike Williams, if you, with, for say Carolina, for Baltimore, for certain teams that have a quarterback and a situation that works for him, probably a top 10 type of player. For other teams, it might be a top 15, 20, 25 type of player. So, you know, yes, you have to stack the board into one straight line deal just because that's what they make us do. But, you know, that type of analysis is absolutely crucial where, where they, a guy goes. They make us do? Stuff. Steve, you, you're in charge of our – you're a director of college scouting. Yeah, I, yeah. Am, in, I am in charge. But, Who uh, you are going to guess, yeah. It's, they, good, they uh, it's good hashtag content having a straight up big board. It is. I agree. So, all right, on to keep moving on to old scouting reports here. Those were the risers and fallers. Talking about the wide receiver class still, we're going to hit on a couple wide receiver reports from last season that we did. Number one, Michael Thomas, the guy who we called the first rounder uh, last season. Here's what he here's some of his report from last year that Gordon McGinnis wrote stats to know he dropped just five of 115 catchable passes the last two seasons. Very good hands. Great after the catch, averaged 6.6 yards after the catch per reception and forced missed tackles on 23.2% of his receptions. Uses hands well to defeat press coverage, helping to create separations. An impressive footwork looked very impressive on double moves. Biggest concerns here. is not slow, but not a burner either. Ran a, ran a 4 5 seventh combine. Potentially held back by quarterback play but very limited production has only 110 receptions and 1,580 yards over the past two years. We comped him to Michael Floyd had a first round grade on him. He went the second. I think he was easily the best rookie receiver last season. Yeah. I mean, it was one of those things where he doesn't get, he didn't get a ton of targets. Um, Terrible QB situation at Ohio state with Cardell Jones and JT Barrett, their accuracy is all over the place. But I think the more you watch Thomas in in all situations, you saw that smooth route running. You saw that he could separate. Of course, goes to a great situation with the Saints. Yes. But, you know, that helps a ton. But at the hmm. same time, the route running and a lot of the things that he brought to the table, uh, that's what pushed us pushed him up to the first round. Because from a pure grade standpoint, he was a little, de- you know, it's a little dependent on what Cardell and JT Barrett were doing. And they didn't help him out at all. But you could see those skills on tape from Thomas. And we felt really good about him in the first round. So I thought I, the thing I liked about Thomas was he would, even though he wasn't fast, he would eat up that cushion pretty quickly off the line of scrimmage. So he wasn't right out the gates. He was quick. He didn't have great get to long speed. Again, he didn't have great long speed, but he had good suddenness. And so that's why he, I think he runs a real nice slant now in the NFL, runs a real nice hitch. And he can make a living off of doing that in the New Orleans scheme. So I think that was another one where. Maybe he was a little dependent on going to a scheme where they utilized him in that role where he's going to run a lot of hitches and slants, 
But the uh, Saints, I think he still was worthy of a first round pick and was worthy was a first round talent. And that's what we called him. So on to a guy who we also called a first round talent who probably if he was traded right now from a season, he was drafted in the first round a season ago, would not command a fourth rounder even. What would you trade right now for Laquan Treadwell, Steve? I don't know. I mean, what just because he didn't make the he didn't play the uh, see the field last year. He just because he, he didn't see the field on a team that is probably still in need of wide receiver help at this point. Yeah, it's a little I mean, concerning. he saw it's didn't see the field concerning. for a bad Vikings receiving core. It's a little concerning. I, so we were lower on Treadwell than most, and there were a lot of mocks. I, I ended up putting him in the second round. We had him late first. When I all still think if you have a late, late second or early third, he's a guy you might want to take a look at. The thing I still think he could do is he can win on slants. He can win in the red zone. I don't the, – the, he was he was supposed 28th to be – 28th on our final big board is where he ended up, so. Yeah. I, it's still lower than most, but, you know, mm-hmm. looking back, definitely higher than – it should, probably should have been based off what he played, four snaps or whatever it was. But I would say <laughs> there's still something there as far as specifics that he does. Separates well on slants, wins in the red zone, that type of thing. But people thought he was going to be all Sean Jeffrey, and he mm-hmm. doesn't have those types we of – We did. That's what we put – that's our comp for him. Yeah, yeah but – I. I know from a style standpoint, he just he's, <laughs> it, but it goes down to the how often. He's not going to win as I often know. at the catch point as Alshon Jeffrey. Style-wise, that's what he needs to be because he doesn't separate that well, but he's not an Alshon Jeffrey, like, top 10 type of pick. That's All right, here's what we wrote about him. We said, great use of hands to get free from press coverage. Plays the ball extremely well in the air. Does well separating on slants. Your, uh, your favorite. Uh, and then... Biggest concerns about him, separation was generally poor. We'll have to win at the catch point in the NFL. And then then this should have been, I guess we should have seen this coming when our next point is inconsistent at the catch point, but out muscles defensive backs at times. Uh, so he'll have to win at the catch point, and then he's inconsistent at the catch point. We should, that we should have logically put those two together, too. He outmuscles those SEC <laughs> DBs. There were points in his career, though, at Ole Miss where he worked the back shoulder fade game with um, – with Dr. Bo Wallace or with Chad Kelly, and and had a lot of success, but uh, no, I, I will say for what for a guy that's supposed to be an Alshon Jeffrey style receiver, he, he wasn't. I was lower on him than we were even, and even I was saying you know late second something like that. But a lot of his struggles as a rookie, I don't think were due to his on the field play. I, I think was pretty clear from what was coming out of Minnesota. It wasn't. It wasn't Treadwell. Just couldn't run a route and that sort of stuff. It had a lot to do with. Uh, maybe some of the off-field off stuff, how he was in the locker room, that sort of thing. So uh, I think I'm think not going to give funny, up on Trevor, but I wouldn't trade a third rounder for him right now. I wouldn't trade a fourth rounder for him at this point. I just I just don't uh, don't see it translating as much. No, I hear you. And I think the funny thing about him, the same way we talked about Mike Williams needed that perfect fit. I thought Treadwell to the Vikings was a terrible fit because yes. it was it was Teddy Bridgewater, and again he's not a guy that's going to force passes into coverage, and you have a guy that doesn't separate very well. So even if it, you know, on the surface it was supposed to be Bridgewater, and here's his new target that I thought was a bad fit. I thought Leonte Carew, who went much later in the draft to to the Dolphins, I thought Carew was a better, much better fit for Minnesota in the North Turner scheme. Which, but now everything's changed. You have Sam Bradford there, and Norv's gone. But regardless, I didn't like the fit to Minnesota as it is because of Bridgewater and just the, you know, the style there for uh, Bridgewater and Treadwell. I agree as well. So. Uh, one guy went to a good position. One guy went to a bad one. But uh, so we'll we'll, we'll see. We'll, we might revisit this one next year come draft time to see how both these guys did this fall. Uh, on to last segment here, handicapping the draft. Steve's got yikes, seven hundred and fifty bucks laid out at the moment, I believe, on a handful of bets. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all because there's a ton at this point. Last week, though, he dropped three hundred seventy five bucks on the fact that Jabril Peppers won't be a top five pick. Top I am praying. Top, top 20. Jeez. Oh, there's no chance. Top Are you going to pay me when we're in New York? We're going to be in New York doing our Wait, show. SI.com. Uh, are you going to pay me? Is what I is what I was going to oh, say. Oh no, I'm I'm probably going to collect all 750. It's I was going to say that's a real one, one. Is like I gotta. I might leave the country when he misses 20. I'm, you might be running out of the studio there because there's no chance in my mind. I don't know why I put 20. If he goes in the top 20, I will be flabbergasted. Somebody might love him. Point. But oof, I gave really bad odds in this one, so I'm going to try to make my money back here. Over, under, and I 
alluded to this earlier, five cornerbacks going in the first round. I will give you minus 120 on the under, under excuse me, plus 110 on the over. So you said a lot of these guys might be going into the second round mix. Do you see more than five going in the first five or less than five? But you can't bet five, just over under five. <laughs> yeah, I want, to, I want to take five. <laughs> but I know, yeah, I know that's, I hear you. that's not the game. I, I, I would go five. If you asked me two months ago, I would have said over, no doubt. But now we're looking at Sidney Jones probably gone now. I think Marshawn Lattimore is going to go. I think Tredavious White. Jordan Lewis, we love. I don't think he will, though. Uh-oh. The little guy's waking up. We got to wrap the pot up. I'm yeah. going under five. I'm Yeah, I'm going under five. Under five. Sidney Jones Minus is dropping out. Gary Conley's in there, Adoree Jackson, Marlon Humphrey, Tredavious White, Marshawn Lattimore. That's five I think will go. But let's say Tredavious White doesn't go, doesn't. so give me the under. But only How many? 10 bucks. 10. Ooh, low ball on me. All right, that's it for our podcast. Good stuff, Steve. We think we made it out all right, being in two different places. We'll be back, though, next week. I'll be back in Cincinnati. Everybody check out we'll Draft be talking. Pass. And, yes, go check out profootballfocus.com slash draftpass17. Less than two weeks to the draft. We'll be giving away a free one if you guys rate us on iTunes or somewhere. Five-star review. Because we all know you guys love the podcast. Hope you guys have a good week. We'll be back again next Thursday.